Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel for the follow-up video about my previous Concord video here at the Brooklyn's Museum of British Motorsport and Aviation History. In today's video, we'll be taking a closer look at the cockpit of this beautiful lady right here. We'll go over some mind-blowing facts what made Concorde so different from all other airlines and go through an entire flight profile on a typical Concorde trip from London Heathrow to New York's John F. Kennedy Airport. So let's get right to it. Uh, 1383, runway 27, take off. So welcome to Concorde's cockpit. This is in fact a flight simulator and I would like to start with a quote by former British Airways captain John Hutchinson who we'll talk into in the next episode. The first thing I always like to say is this is a proper flight deck. None of this poncy glass cockpit rubbish. These are proper instruments, needles and dials. The man has a point. So the cockpit is laid out for the captain in the left hand seat and the first officer in the right hand seat and a flight engineer seated here at the side of the front of this huge panel with all sorts of dials and switches primarily to monitor the four engines and their intakes such as the fuel and hydraulic system. Concorde is one of the rare airliners who never had an APU installed meaning she was reliant on electrical ground power once it reached its parking position Plus, she needed an air start to provide bleed air for air conditioning and for engine start. Upon startup, the pilots would start the inboard engines first and then perform a cross bleed start to the outer engines one and four. And the engine's idle power was so high that the pilots had to apply brake pressure to stop her from rolling off, which was one of the reasons why she had brake fans and used up to two tons of taxi fuel prior reaching the runway. Now let's imagine we're sitting on the runway getting our takeoff clearance, the pilot monitoring reads back the clearance and the pilot flying applies full throttle on all four engines. Yeah, all set. Okay, three, two, one, now. Primarily the countdown was to get the attention of all three crew members, the flight engineer turned towards the pilot closely monitoring the engine instruments and the starting a timer after the pilot calls out 3, 2, 1, now, because Concorde had to follow very strict noise abatement procedures, being one of the loudest airliners at the time. Then 152,000 pounds of thrust, including the reheaters, which automatically come on once the throttles are fully moved forward, you get pushed back into your seat and the pilot monitoring calls out to assure that the airspeed gauges are working properly, followed by 100 knots, power set. confirmation by the flight engineer, power set. V1. Pilot flying puts the hands onto the yoke. Rotate. The pilot gently pulls onto the yoke as the nose wheel comes off the ground. The delta wing slowly creates lift as it is presented at a relatively high angle of attack. The main gear leaves the ground. V2 indicating the safety speed shortly followed by positive climb and gear up by the pilot flying. So the typical flight path of Concorde would look like this. She takes off at Heathrow with the reheaters on until reaching the nose abatement altitude at about one and a half minutes. Cut the reheaters by announcing three, two, one, noise. The flight engineer reaches into the thrust levers and reduces the thrust by 15% and shuts off the reheats and after reaching a safe altitude and speed, the pilot flying would request nose and visor up to make Concorde more streamlined for high speed flight and at the same time reducing the noise level within the cockpit. She would then be on her way flying westbound towards Reading, where I used to see her as a little boy looking out of the window of my godfather's house, excited to see and especially hear her heading skywards, then continuously climbing at subsonic speeds at Mach 0.95 to 28,000 feet, passing Bath, Bristol and Cardiff. And as soon as she reached the Bristol Channel, on the west coast of England, then the pilots requested a so-called transonic climb and acceleration clearance to 50,000 feet. But there was no stopping in between, so the ATC controller had to lay out a clear path for Concorde so that she could climb unrestricted without any traffic on her flight path to a pre-assigned cruising level. 
The issue was that below Mach 2, she dealt with so much aerodynamic drag, therefore she didn't fly very well at those speeds, plus there was a time limit of 15 minutes on the reheaters. So after receiving the clearance, the pilot re-engaged full thrust and the flight engineer adds the reheaters, which you can see coming on right here. The passengers again were pressed into their seats and a sudden roar as the afterburners fire up and accelerate the plane. She would then slide effortlessly through the sound barrier at Mach 1, no bumps, no bangs, and then accelerated and climbed with the reheaters on until passing Mach 1.75, which was at about 43,000 feet, then cut the reheaters and then gently accelerated and climbed to 50,000 feet, where she then reached Mach 2. The whole supersonic acceleration process would roughly take about 20 to 25 minutes. And Concorde's normal cruising level was in between flight level 500 and 590. Once it passed flight level 500, it reached Mach 2, but she never really stayed at one cruising level. As the engines burn a lot of fuel during climb, the plane got lighter and lighter, and for that matter, she constantly climbed, finding the level she felt comfortable with. The pilots didn't have to get any clearance for further climb because there was no traffic above flight level 410 anyways, so Concorde performed a so-called cruise climb, meaning she never stayed at one level as she was constantly climbing until reaching the top of descent point for approach. A positive side effect of the high cruising level, she was always above any weather like thunderstorms, jet streams, turbulence areas and no traffic, besides other Concords on their way back to Europe. But boy did she had to deal with some difficult issues at those speeds and altitudes. Due to the air compressibility and friction, the outer skin of the aircraft heated up to 120 degrees. The limiting temperature of the structure was 127 degrees and if you were to be flying in warmer air than normal, the clever autopilot system wouldn't control the speed of the aircraft by the Mach number, it controlled the speed by the heat of the airplane's skin. And due to the warm skin temperature, Concorde would stretch up to 9 inches in length during cruising speed. So to compensate the stretching, engineers had to install expansion joints throughout the aircraft. For example, the cabin floor was sitting on rollers so that the airframe around it could expand but wouldn't affect the cabin floor as it wasn't fixed to the airframe. Another big issue was as the plane accelerated towards Mach 2 due to the supersonic shock waves, the center of lift moves further back than usual but the center of gravity didn't change at all, meaning the airplane got a nose down attitude. Now to compensate that problem, the center of gravity had to be moved to the rear. Now you couldn't expect the high class passengers to walk to the rear of the airplane, so instead, the flight engineer pumped fuel from the forward fuel tank to the aft fuel tank. And if I say aft, I mean way aft into tank 11, which was below the vertical stabilizer. But the fuel was then unusable during supersonic cruise as it had to remain tame in the tank to keep the balance of the aircraft. And pilots named it ballast fuel as you were flying it around with you, but you couldn't use it until slowing down to subsonic speeds and the center of lift moved forward again. But how fast she really was tells the story by many Concorde pilots saying she was a time traveling machine. As they pulled up their car at Heathrow Airport for the evening flight Speedbird 3 departing London at 7 p.m. to New York John F. Kennedy, they saw the sun set and then took off in a pitch dark. At about two-thirds into the flight, the pilots and passengers were treated with a spectacular view as the sun was rising in the west. So they would then land in the late afternoon in New York and would see their second sunset on the same day. So that proved that Concorde was faster than the Earth's rotation. So now let's end our cruise flight and prepare for approach. Now the descent planning was crucial as Concorde had a requirement that she had to fly subsonic 50 nautical miles prior reaching the coastline. And this video here shows why.
Here you can clearly hear the double bang created by the shockwave at Mark II. Now you wouldn't want that bang over Manhattan. And by the way, this was one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia didn't want Concorde to fly across their country, as the loud bang would disturb camel breeding. I am not kidding, that was their argument. So it took her 110 to 120 nautical miles to decelerate from supersonic speeds to an a cruising level to subsonic speeds and flight levels where other airliners would cruise and prepare for approach. So the pilots started their descent profile 160-170 miles prior the coastline to match the speeds and flight levels to get in sequence with other slower flying airliners. So that was it for today. Make sure to tune in for next week as I'll be going through the approach and landing phase of Concorde and we'll be talking about the exclusive passengers who enjoyed the privilege to fly on this extraordinary plane. Make sure to perform a touch and go at my Instagram account as I'll be uploading many pictures of my experiences with this beautiful plane. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification bell. See you next week. All the best, your Captain Joe.